I've been thinking back to three significant events in my life. One of them was, some of you are aware, I was 16. She was 15. Shouldn't happen. They'd only moved to the community a few months before. I had a house built. It was on a hillside. It had been raining. Andrea was walking outside the house, overlooking overlooking the cliff. Ground gave way. She fell about 50 feet, hit her head at the bottom against a tree. When they found her, she was unconscious. They rushed her to the hospital. There was a clot in her brain. They did an operation, a brain operation, and for three days. For three days, Andrea was in a coma. I don't know that I've ever prayed steadily for three days about one thing until then. I remember going to bed and sleeping for two or three hours and then going back to the hospital to be with her. It's close to the family, felt closer to her. We were friends. I stood by her side in ICU when they didn't allow family or uh, a distant family or friends, certainly, not to be in the room, but I'd convinced, her, I'd convinced them I was her brother. Yeah, it was true. We we're related by blood, just not our own. <laughs> and so I stood by her side and held her hand and begged God to heal her. She died that Friday. I thought, is any of this real? This Jesus raised from the dead business? Is this stuff that I grew up hearing and singing and studying and putting on flannel, bored, the dead and the buried and the resurrected Jesus? Is any of this real? Does it really make any sense at all? Does it make a difference? Fast forward a number of years. I'm preaching in Port Huron, Michigan. Had become friends with Cliff and Jan. Jan and I had gone to their house a few times. Had learned to play, uh, had, had learned to play some do- domino game. I can't remember, Yurts, I think. And we'd, uh, we enjoyed this couple. He was a heavy smoker all of his life. He'd quit the last two or three years of his life, but it had already had its ravages, of ravage effects on his lungs. And Cliff had gone to the hospital and was on the breathing machine, had a tracheotomy, and, and I remember holding his hand while Jan was in the room, his wife Jan, not my wife, she wasn't there. I was holding Cliff's hand, and I remember praying for him, and while holding his hand, he took his last breath. I'd been with bodies before of people who had died, but I'd never been with someone when the last breath had been taken. To say that that didn't shake me would be a lie. I didn't watch a spirit leave his body, but I I watched a man die. And once again in my early 30s, I asked God, is any of this real? This resurrection of Jesus, does it really matter? Fast forward to just three years ago. Many of you walked this journey with me. You saw Jan and the the effects of the cancer and how in three to four months we watched a woman in her 50s turned to a woman in her 80s physically. Her mom and dad were on the phone. We had it on speakerphone. Jessica, Trisha, Trisha actually was also funneled in by phone, and David and I. And Jan's mother pray, <laughs> prayed on the phone. And then she said, Jan, honey, you are about to be released from the prison of your body. It was a few hours later, struggling for breath. That had happened for some time. 
I was exhausted. I said, I'm going to go in and take a shower. I remember I came out and, and the kids said, Dad, you want to come here now? And I went over and I took her hand. And she breathed her last. Is any of this real? Does it really matter? Is Jesus really alive? Because if he is, this makes sense. And if he's not, none of this makes sense. That's where I was and that's where I am. In all three occasions, I have preached way too many funerals in my short time on, on, on this world. Way too many young people. Babies who should have never died. It's not right. It's not fair. Teenagers. Young adults. Parents. It ought to be like my grandmother who made it to 100 years and 43 days. That ought to be. But let me tell you, there are two things that are not beautiful. One is the aging process. Now, I understand. Wrinkles are good, and we ought to celebrate every wrinkle and every gray hair, and I've got a few, and I celebrate every day. But the point... (laughs) Every day you're on this side of the grass is a good day, right? The, The fact of aging and death were never intended to be the beautiful part of life. As we exit this world in a natural way and our bodies begin the process of entropy, going back to the ground from which it was created, one day this whole body, should I live long enough to die of a natural cause? Some some place bets. I'm in so many accidents. But here's the point. The body will somehow die. This, this machine in which I live will die, go back to the ground from which it was made. But I, I sincerely believe, I, the real me who lives inside this body, will continue to live on. God created me at a specific point, and I have no end. God created you at a specific point when the egg and the sperm joined. You came into existence. Life started. A human being began. You were born into the world and God had created you at the beginning and you've lived this long that we're standing here, sitting here together talking about life and death matters. And should we all go out the exit in a normal, natural way? Isn't it weird we talk about death as if it were natural? Never intended. God created us as eternal beings. Our bodies are going to go back to the ground. And our loved ones are going to stand around and talk about us. And some of our enemies are going to dance and celebrate. If the real story is known and you are walking with the Lord, everyone who knows that and is walking with the Lord will celebrate with you on your exit. So I ask these questions. Whenever we watch a man like Jesus die the way he died, beaten as he was beaten, scourged with a cat of nine tails, pieces of pottery and and, and metal on the end of these leather straps, these nine leather straps wrapping around his back, pulling up hunks of death, or hunks of flesh rather, and he... Please, by his stripes we're told we were healed, we were pierced for our transgressions. Old Testament, 700 years before Christ, the crucifixion, the beating and the crucifixion so vividly portrayed. We watch him die the way he died. Not even looking like a human being suffering on the cross the way he did. We watch his body being taken down from the cross. There's no question, this man is dead. He's wrapped up rapidly because Passover's coming. They put him in a hewn-out-of-rock tomb. That's borrowed. Of course it's borrowed. He only needs it for a few days. He's placed in a tomb. This huge rock is rolled in front of it and later is sealed. Of course, they investigated, making sure the body was there. And it was sealed, and guards are placed around Now put yourself with the disciples on Saturday 
Friday is the worst day of your life. You watched him die. You heard him say, It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You heard him scream out with a loud voice and you saw him drop his head and die. You were there when they put his body in the tomb. You were there when they put the stone in front. You were there when, you, when everyone walked away with their eyes swollen and tears pulling down their cheeks. You were there. Your own eyes were swollen. The tears were dropping in your cheeks. Could you ever imagine that that man from that tomb after that death would be raised from the dead? Impossible. Peter, John, the tomb is empty. Let's go back and look at that again. John chapter 20. It's the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Verse 2. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, to whom the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where, he's, where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there and didn't go in. But Peter came and following him, ran into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and, keyword, believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. What did John believe? Something strange had happened there. Peter was convinced something strange had happened there. John was convinced something strange had happened there. Peter wasn't so sure. John believed. Could it be he's alive? The beginnings of trust, the remembrance of the words, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And when I come back to life again, I'll see you in Galilee. Words from Jesus that made no sense to them at the time, but now begin to flood back into John's mind. Let's pick back up there and continue to read. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and so they left, but Mary stayed behind. She obviously ran with them back to the tomb. And she wept. She stooped to look inside the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said, They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. She didn't know it was Jesus. And she said, He said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. And I will take him away. Jesus said to her. Dale Carnegie said, There is no sweeter sound than your own name being spoken. I wonder how this sounded to her when she heard Jesus say in a very distinct tone that was recognizable to her. Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbi, which means teacher. She said, he said, no, don't cling to me. I've not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers 
and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord! And that he had said these things to her. Now we're told in other accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they had trouble with that testimony. I have a question for you. Why do you suppose Jesus appeared to her and to the other women first? Why did he give them the privilege of being the first ones to proclaim the message of the resurrection to a group of men who had a difficulty accepting it? What do you suppose is going on there? Is there anything going on there? I have a feeling, some of you women are going, yeah, that's right, I have to tell you what it is. I have a, and some of you guys are saying, no, because you're still stuck in this male chauvinist pig position. Oink with me, please. Here's, here's what I think God's doing. He's flipping everything on its ear. He's turning everything on its ear. He who should not be alive is now alive, and those who should not be speaking about him being alive are now proclaiming it to the world, at least to the disciples, who should have believed, but they doubted. On the evening of that day, of, of that very day, on the evening, read with me, on the evening of that very day. John chapter 20, verse 19. Do you have your Bibles? Are you reading with me? On the evening of that very day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom. Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw, It's the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Shalom. It is peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. The resurrected, victorious King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who took care of our sin, buried in the tomb, raised again on the very day of the resurrection, said, the Father sent me and that's the way I'm sending you into the world. And he, when he said this, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Someday we'll talk about what that is referring to, okay? And Thomas was one of the twelve when, uh, he's called the twin. He went with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. And he said, nah, unless I put, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and I put my hand into his side, I will never believe. I understand, I think, where Thomas is. How about you? You guys are out of your mind. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. And he said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas as if he were there eight days before, hearing the conversation. He said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand out, put out your hand and place it in my side. Don't disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered, my master and my God, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, and I see a smile, I hear a chuckle. Do you believe because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet they believe. You are among the crowd to whom Jesus just blessed. You are part of that company of believers. 
that Jesus had said, more blessed are you, that you haven't seen. You didn't put your finger there. You didn't put your hand up his side. And yet you believe. You put your life on the line. You have accepted the resurrected one. You've taken him as the solution to your life now and the hope of your life forever. You have accepted from him forgiveness of sins, the love of God, and a change of state where everything is now gone. All has become new. Everything has changed. Everything has now become new. You were the sinner. You are now the saint. You were the condemned. You're now the redeemed. You were the dead. You are now alive. You were the ones who were dishonorable, and you were alienated, and you were hostile to God. You are now brought near, and you are friends of God. You've accepted His love. You are filled with His joy. You are honored, glorified, justified. You have a new heart beating in your chest. You are a child of God. And that's what Jesus has done, and He accomplished it in two things, the empty cross and the empty tomb. And you participated with that. Read with me now Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, the beginning portion of this. He says, what are we going to say? Should sin keep on controlling us? Should we keep on living in sin so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Hmm. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. You are new, lived people. That should bring a hallelujah out of somebody. That should be an amen out of somebody. That should bring a whoa, isn't that great, out of somebody. Somebody in here ought to feel a little more excited than you were when you first walked in. When I first began this message in a, in a point and a tone of doom and confusion and bewilderment, it is now the solution has been offered. The one who is the answer to life gave his life, was buried, and three days later is alive, and that tomb is still empty. That's good news. That is our testimony. You say, I don't have a tes personal testimony. I don't know. I haven't heard his voice. I didn't see him. You have a testimony. You who were dead are now alive. You who were lost are now find, found. You find. You who were blind, that's where, you who were blind now can... See, that's you people. That's me people. That's me people. That's our testimony. Hallelujah. There we go. If we've been united with him in his death like this, we're going to certainly be united with him in his resurrection like that. You and I have already participated in our own funeral the day we were baptized into Christ. When you surrendered to him and you said to him, My Lord and my God... I don't know everything that that means. I don't know what it means to completely surrender to your will. I don't even know your will completely yet. But as I learn your will, you're going to get more and more of my life. On that day, you decided you're going to surrender yourself to Jesus. You were buried with him. That's what this water tub is for here. That's what the rivers were created for. That's what the lakes are for. That's what the water trough is for. That's what the bathtub is for. When you're ready to surrender to Jesus, where there's enough water to cover you, there's enough for you to be buried in the Christ. And it doesn't matter when it is or where it is. It doesn't have to be a Sunday morning. It'd be great, wouldn't it, if it was an Easter Sunday morning on his resurrection day that you celebrated your own resurrection. And his death and burial and resurrection, we're not going to hold you there for three days. We're going to bring you up in three seconds. But the point is you're going to go under and you're going to come out. And when there may be enough sin. We may need to hold you down for a little while. But the blood of Jesus washes clear. And we say to you, dead, and you're buried and brought out, now alive. We'll sing happy birthday. It is a new day. It's a new beginning. It's a whole new start with the flesh. A flesh. A fresh. Well, you're still stuck in the flesh. You're going to have trouble with it. But a fresh, clean start. I'm here to tell you good news. I'm an ambassador for Christ begging you. Why don't you be reconciled to God? 
Why don't you let him? Look at Colossians now. In, in light of what I mean, I feel like I'm getting a little excited. I hope you are too. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. We're going to start in verse, meh, verse 8. You got your Bibles? Open them up. That's page 1778, by the way. Colossians 2. <laughs> we have bookmarks back here in the back that have been anonymously, anonymously donated. And uh, back on these two tables, if you'd like a bookmark, and they all have the books of the Bible... You've been challenged by this anonymous donor. If you don't have the books of the Bible memorized, take those and learn them. They're back here on the back. And for the younger ones in particular, work on that. When I was six years old, I could say the books of the Bible faster than any person in our church. You can do that. Okay, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. Watch. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells. Notice the present tense of the verb. Dwells, presently dwells, bodily. Jesus gave up his place next to God as God taking on our humanity died in a body The body was buried. The body was literally physically raised from the dead and in the process of ascension into heaven glorified and spiritualized. I have no clue what I just said. I cannot explain it except to say he is presently bodily. He is the God-man. It was an eternal sacrifice. This was not a temporary visit. This was something that changed him forever. Forever voluntarily, God himself taking on our flesh, now bodily, the fullness of deity dwells in him bodily. That's what it says. God was not once a man who became a God. He is a God. He is the God who became a man. Jesus the Christ. Bodily, fully. Stay with me. Because this is where it really gets cool. All right? Up until now, we've read something neat about Jesus. This is where you put your name in. Ready? Verse 10. And you. On the count of three, I want you to put your name here. And you. Ready? One, two, three. Kevin has been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him, you. Put your name there. We're circumcised. With the circumcision made without hands, by the putting off of the body of the flesh, not by that kind of circumcision, but by the circumcision of Christ. Here's where it happened. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him. This is the emphasis of it all. Baptism does nothing if we leave you under the water. Okay? Having been raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. You attended your own funeral, but you also celebrate your own resurrection. This is where the power of it all comes in. This is where the meaning comes in. This is where all of the Old Testament and the New Testament, I can believe it all is true if the resurrection of Jesus is true. I'm sitting across one of my students at Boise State University. We're talking about death. We're talking about the possibility of resurrection. And I told him, I said, I am more confident, I am more confident that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead than I am that you're sitting across the table from me right now. If I were to see a a, a miracle performed, it would not deepen my faith any more than I already am convinced Jesus Christ is alive. You, that is your testimony. It's not just mine. It's been 2,000 years. But a day is like a 1,000 years, and a 1,000 years is like a day. So from God's perspective, Jesus has only been gone a couple days. He was raised on the third day, maybe around 3,000. Uh, maybe in the next five minutes. That's just it. We don't know when he's coming back. He's either coming back or you're going to die. One of those orders. But one of those two things is going to happen. 
He's coming back, and those of us who were still alive at that time will be changed immediately. Twinkly of an eye kind of stuff. Our bodies are going to be changed. We're going to float up and be with the Lord forever. I don't know what that means either, but that's what it says. And But those who are dead in Christ, they're going to be raised first. We're going to precede that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Go ahead and write those down. You read them later. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Watch the dead and the resurrected ones. We conclude with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The very last set of verses. The very, very last paragraph or two. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50. I'm going to read fast. You read fast with me. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, in the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall it come to pass, saying, that what is, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? In all three of those occasions that I told you about, my good friend Andrea, my friend Cliff, and my wife Jan, and I say, where is your victory? Where is your sting? He's been taken away. Christ has been dead, and he was raised from the dead, and he is our victory. And so we're saying the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have that hope, I have that hope. You have that assurance, I have that assurance. Your body's hurting. My body's hurting. We are yearning and longing for the day when we're going to be raised from the dead. Either we're going to go through that six foot hole or he's going to come back and take us home immediately. But we are longing for that day when our perishable bodies will be swallowed up in imperishability. Therefore, because of all that, Final word on the matter. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. I'm here to tell you, there is an end to the thing that takes place on this world. There is no end in our relationship with Jesus that begins at our own resurrection. Eternal life has already started. We are the new Jerusalem come down from heaven. We are celebrating the feast of the wedding with the lamb and the bride. We are the bride. We're not just guests at the table. We are the bride at the table. you are not brides. We, the church, bride at the table. He is victorious. He's the one come already on the white horse with the sword from his mouth. It is by the message that I just proclaimed to you that nations are defeated, kings are brought to their knees, and people surrender to the lordship of Jesus. It is this message that is the sword coming out of the mouth of the king himself, the king of kings and lord of lords, riding on the white horse, Revelation chapter 19. I'm here to tell you that's already happened and that's who we are. It is that sword coming out that cuts people in half where we say, oh my goodness, I'm undone. I have no hope without Jesus. But with Jesus Christ, He is my hope. He's the answer. Would you surrender to Him? We're going to stand and sing. I'm going to ask you to surrender to Jesus. So take the first step now. Let's all stand. While we're singing, I'm going to ask you to take the second step. If you need to respond to the message of Jesus Christ, making his testimony yours, accepting his life to be your life, accepting his forgiveness, his love, his joy, his peace to fill your heart, then today is your birthday. Why not make that happen today? Let's pray. Lord, 
You've given us the victory. You are our victory. You've given us the hope. You are our hope. You've given us a reason to live and a confidence to die. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for all of that. And it's in your name and to your glory, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.